Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in uh, to the new CHIP uh, Demo Week. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, having uh, a panel that is going to be talking about food safety and automation in ag tech. And uh, with me today, I have a venture anal associate, Christian Horn from Cultivian Sandbox. And Cultivian Sandbox is um, was created to invest in innovative and agricultural companies who are commercializing technologies that increase sustainable production, equitable distribution, and safety and healthy consumption in the food space. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Christian, and then I'll introduce uh, my other two guests who are startup companies in the space. Christian, can you tell me a little bit of a background uh, about yourself and what led you uh, uh, to uh, your position today and a little bit more about Cotivian Sandbox. Be great. Thank you. Sure. So yeah, my background, I joined Cultivian Sandbox about a year and a half ago. I was previously an investment banking analyst at JP Morgan, uh, focused on power utility and renewable energy companies for M&A and equity deals. Um, and in addition to that, I had a number of side projects, which really led me to the VC world uh, those included an artificial intelligence investment thesis that I got started on uh, my senior year of college. I also did a little bit of business development and financial modeling consulting uh, for startups going through Techstars, and then also made an angel investment as well in an artificial intelligence startup in, in Chicago. So all of those side projects in combination with the work I was doing at JP Morgan, we did work with a number of large, uh, at the time, clean tech corporate VCs. Uh, that all really led me to go into the venture world. Um, and food and ag had always been an interest area of mine, even though I didn't cover it in a professional sense at, at J.P. Morgan. So that's a little bit about my background and what led me to the VC industry. And then in terms of Cultivian Sandbox, we, we were founded in 2006, uh, originally by Andy Zilkowski and Ron Musin. Uh, Ron was the former head of R&D at Dow AgroSciences. Uh, Andy has been a career VC, and uh, they noticed that at the time, there were no exclusive funds who were focused on food and ag tech. Uh, so they created the first Cultivian fund. It was a little over $35 million. And then when they went out to raise fund two, they realized that they could leverage partners who had more food tech experience. So they partnered with Sandbox Industries in around 2012. And Sandbox Industries was founded by Bob Shapiro, Nick Rosa. Uh, Bob was a former CEO of Monsanto. Uh, Nick was a former CEO of NutraSuite. Uh, they had originally started with healthcare VC at Sandbox, but wanted to get into food and ag tech given their backgrounds. Uh, so that's how Cultivian and Sandbox uh, merged together. Uh, very creative name. Uh, but yeah, they did Fund 2, which is $115 million, And then right now we're investing out of Fund 3, which is $135 million. So that's a little bit of the origin story for Cultivian and Sandbox. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And we also have Benjamin Cook, who's the founder and CEO of Zirconia. And uh, Zirconia, tell you a little bit, is a coding company that uh, uses advanced materials to produce and market high performance, long lasting, eco friendly coatings or ceramic sealants. Uh, and they are uh, addressing food safety issues in agriculture, husbandry, barns, and with food manufacturers. So, that being said, Benjamin, can you tell? Um, Tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to start the company. Yeah, so my, my background, uh, UC Berkeley, environmental science and law, and then I uh, later got an MBA in sustainable business. Uh, this is my fifth business. I've been running businesses for 30 years. Uh, I like to say I, I never had a real job. I, I was always my own boss, which is kind of the worst kind of boss, right? Because the hours are long and the, the pay is bad. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the reward is there. Uh, you know, Zirconia is very exciting because, you know, I sold my last company to Milliken. Um, my investors got a five exit in under two years, which was nice. Uh, but it did really great work, right? We, we figured out how to restore pipes underground without, uh, without digging up the road. And that, that's great for agriculture, roadways, and all sorts of uses. And for... You know, the inspiration for Zirconia was really to take this coating that's uh, this special ceramic 
and apply it to the infrastructure around food, animal husbandry, to solve key problems which have, have never been solved before. And, and we've got a lot of people excited, including Tyson Foods now. Great, great. And we'll kind of delve into that um, yeah. as we go. Um, I'd like to introduce Mark DeSantis from Bloomfield Robotics, the founder CEO, and Bloomfield Robotics assesses the health and performance of plants, one plant at a, at a time, actually using deep learning and AI. Um, and uh, right now has relationships and is doing business with several of the specialty crop growers in North America, South America, and the European Union. So with that said, uh, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your history, your background, what led you to start Bloomfield and sure. um, what problem you're solving? Okay, great. Sure, sure. I'm um, a serial entrepreneur. I've been doing this for 15 years. This is my third AI-based business, uh, venture-backed. Uh, previous companies have been in power markets, um, infrastructure, defense, uh, all using some version of AI. And I was at a point where I was, I guess, ready to kind of kick back and teach. I teach part-time at Carnegie Mellon. And um, I met two folks who are the co-founders of this company who at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. And they said, look, you know, we take pictures of plants um, and then we use those pictures to tell you the condition of the plant, one plant at a time. And I thought, well, this is, I got to do this. <laughs> so I, I, I just said, hey, please let me work here. And they asked me to be CEO shortly after that. So I've been CEO for about a year and a half now. Company's two years old. We're in uh, 15 vineyards in four states and Canada. We have three customers now in France, two in Bordeaux, one in Burgundy, uh, two in Italy. Uh, most are wine grapes, some are table grapes. And then we also have a blueberry grow in Peru that just started and a cacao farm in, uh, um, in Colombia. And we'll be adding a couple of apple orchards. So we're in all kinds of specialty crops. Uh, the challenge there with specialty crops is you know, crops need inspection and they've needed inspection since, you know, agriculture's existed for 10,000 years. Typically it's done by people and sometimes with drones. And what we said is, look, why don't we uh, use our AI, our deep learning to assess individual plants? And so we build a camera that sits on anything that moves, goes up and down the rows, takes very high quality images, and then uh, using um, particular uh, stereo imaging, it creates a three-dimensional uh, three digital twin of what, see, what it sees, and then it commences to apply the analytics that we trained it to do. Um, what's To me, what's cool and what's probably guided a lot of my businesses is I like to go where a friend of mine calls big and boring businesses, where the industry is a... Um, uh, a large industry that doesn't normally use advanced technology. Um, you know, Ben talked about roads. Uh, that's a big industry. <laughs> that's a big problem. My last company uses, a uses AI to assess road surfaces in 250 cities around the world on it with a cell phone and deep learning. Big problem, but nobody thought to say bring AI to that problem. Uh, similarly, in power space, had a similar interesting application of technology. So, so it's, a, it's a way to do good because the first part of my career I spent in the federal government in different capacities way back when, a million years ago. So public service to me is um, sort of elemental to, to who I am. And so I'm able to apply both, in a sense, public service, if you will, and, and the creative uh, world of entrepreneurship together into one thing. And that's what, drew, that's what drives me. Well, that's great, right? I'm gonna kind of go back to Christian Horn. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the some of the critical problems that you see uh, facing ag tech and, and the food supply just in general? Sure, sure. And I know uh, Benjamin and Mark with their respective startups and what they're doing. I don't want to overlap too much uh, with potentially where they might go. But I, I think a couple that stand out to me, one is the underlying data infrastructure in the industry. Uh, there's been a lot of collection of new data sources, new data types uh, related to agriculture. But, you know, we're still trying to figure out how can we connect 
all these data sources together in a clean standardized format uh, so that we can build analysis on top of that data. So I think that's one area that the industry continues to develop on and I think will be really a big enabler uh, for some of the more technologies that are to come. Uh, another is just resource efficiency. This really ties in with the broader uh, climate change initiatives that you're seeing across the world, but how can we be more efficient with various inputs, various resources that we're using? Uh, and then I think another is really thinking about, uh, this is very recent, in my opinion, inflation rising costs. Uh, how can we make sure that consumers are still able to affordably uh, eat and, and drink clean standard water? Uh, I think that's something that's coming into play recently. It impacts all different kinds of supply chains as well. There's various differences by geography, but I think it's really important uh, that we make sure that uh, costs are able to continue to stay uh, reasonable for, for the broader consumer population. So that's another one that's top of mind for me. No, that, that's great. And uh, I'm, I'm just curious, um, Matt, that's a good point in terms of a more recent change. Um, how have things in the VC world, uh, how are they different now to where they were pre pandemic um, or, or what, where has it evolved and how has it changed? Do you think? Yeah, with regards to the, the VC role and, and some of how we're operating, essentially, I, I think obviously everybody's on Zoom meetings and video conferencing these days. I think the biggest change stemming from that has really just been the process of figuring out what information can funds get comfortable with to make investments. Uh, I think everybody has a different, uh, I think, baseline level of, of confidence with making investments over video calls. Uh, and I think at this point, almost every major fund has made an investment post pandemic. Uh, so people are adjusting, but I think that process just took a, a little bit of time. And then also thinking about uh, geographically, now that teams are perhaps spread out across different regions, how can you make sure communication stays effective, but also how are you going to continue to build out your relationships in different ecosystems that you're now uh, planning routes in because a lot of people have moved around from their previous locations uh, pre-COVID. So I think that's another big change. You're seeing a network shift in where people's networks are based uh, and where they're going to continue to expand in the future. Has it affected the types of companies that you invest in? As, as you just implied, there has been some it has been some, you know, acceleration of some different problems because of COVID, inflation, possibly just uh, supply chain and, and those types of interruptions. Um, do you find that's kind of caused you to change your focus at all? Or, or are there any other trends that might uh, have come into play over the last two years um, where you have had to pivot in terms of your focus? I think the main pivot has just been understanding to the extent that a business might be impacted by things such as lockdowns or, or limits in in-person activity. I think digitizing a business to an extent, just understanding how you're able to do that if you do have to navigate less in-person interactions for however you conduct your business. That's probably the only major change I, I would say. It's just that's top of mind. If that's going to impact sales cycle, delay projects, uh, related sometimes to CapEx build out if that's part of the business plan. But I wouldn't say it, it's a major shift. It's just something we think about a tad bit more than previously. Okay. Okay. Um, Benjamin, I know that uh, Zirconia could actually address many different industries. And one big focus for you has been ag tech and, and food. And yeah. can you talk a little Absolutely. bit more about, you know, the problems that exist um, for agriculture, food manufacturers? You know, what are the key concerns? Have those increased um, over the past uh, year and, and how you address those concerns? Yeah, you know, the, the pan pandemic certainly put pressure on industrial hygiene. Um, so the hygiene of surfaces is something that our technology addresses, which has made life a little bit easier. Um, I think the, you know, having people shoulder to shoulder in a lot of these facilities 
it, it was just very difficult for people at JBS, Tyson, uh, it, usually the a lot of the protein guys who the kill houses, a lot of the food processors where people are just kind of close in uh, to figure out how to deal with air handling and how to deal with surfaces. Uh, obviously, our tech deals with surfaces. So when we're having a discussion with uh, Purdue Farms or Tyson, they're interested uh, in our technology because our technology doesn't allow uh, bacteria or virus to survive. So either it's on a wall or a ceiling or a flooring system. And we, we shut down the ability of the facility to hold its own biome, uh, basically getting rid of biofilm. And so if you, if you look at the pattern even before, uh, be before the pandemic, the biggest issue really is, you know, the, the number of infections of people are actually going down of employees uh, and, and people eating, food, eating the food they produce as well. But the amount of toxicity, the pathogenicity is actually going up. And that's because buildings are made with porous materials that have their own biofilm formation. And that biofilm gets to survive because of the porosity of concrete and the porosity of wood. And people never had a way to seal it or fix that problem before. And, and now they do. So when, when we came in uh, to say, Dr. Stuart Ritchie, he, he runs the global platinum brooding project, uh, platinum brooding standard for raising broiler chickens around the world. And he consults with all the major, uh, you know, chicken producers and turkey producers around the world. Uh, he said that the interesting thing was not that we have an antimicrobial surface, but we allowed concrete to be clean for the first time, which means we also get rid of the biofilm because it's like a Petri dish that just sits there and the bacteria and the virus and the fungi all share DNA and they get smarter and smarter and smarter over time. So it, it's harder and harder to adapt to them because they're always adapting to you. Nature, is very, nature fills voids very well. But when we put our ceramic down, it eliminates all habitat for microbial life. And it has uh, three different kill mechanisms at the surface. Uh, I won't get into too much of that, but it's a little bit tricky. Uh, oxidative surface and these electrostatic nanoswords and so on. Uh, but basically it doesn't allow the building to hold that biome. And that reduces the toxicity of the building dramatically. And then we've, we've come up with some other technology, but I don't want to be too up with too much chemistry all in one conversation. Yeah, um, actually, it'd be great to know if, if you can give uh, an example or two of, you know, current users, current customers, be they food manufacturers and, you know, um, how do they use it specifically and what, you know, what if any, I know it's been kind of recent, but, um, their, their results? Sure, sure. Uh, we did a really nice company, Johnson Foods, which manufactures uh, maraschino cherries and asparagus, right? So if you go to Costco and you buy the pickled asparagus, that's from Johnson Foods, uh, grown in Eastern Washington. And they have problems with food acids and they have problems with biologicals, uh, micro, you know, E. coli or whatever. That, that. So we went in uh, to a, their new build facility. We've coated the floor and we coated the CMU wall with our ceramic surface treatment. And our ceramic surface treatment is a geopolymer chemistry. It, it's similar to what the Romans used in ancient times building the Colosseum. We're just a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, the interesting thing about actually coating cement masonry units is this is a type of brick that is very common in food and construction but it's about 20% open space, which means food and water go in and they don't come out and it tends to breed a lot of bacteria and then just kind of weeps those bacteria back out into the food space, right? So now we've sealed the CMU block wall. This is a pretty big facility. So you've got hundreds and hundreds of linear feet of, this, of these walls and they're now self-sterilizing. Well, that, that's a pretty nice feature. But in addition to that, cement mason units are very soft. So if you hit it with a power washer, which is the way people clean, 3000 PSI will cut a hole in the, in the block. 
but with our material, it can't be harmed by pressure washers. So these are, these are some modifications of, of the cleaning process because in the food industry, you're, you're cleaning every day. So the facility has to be pretty robust. It has to be immune to chemistry and the, the pressure, the physical assault of the cleaning process. And our material makes that, makes that happen really for the first time because there's never been a way to seal cement masonry units for. And so you, you get a lot of these little wins, you know, their, their floor is now self-sterilizing. That's great. They're, they're not gonna have E. coli, they're not gonna have listeria. And even though you're taking asparagus has dirt, you know, you're, you're washing it, you know, bacteria are everywhere. But at the end of the day, the place is clean and then it cleans itself overnight. So it's wonderful, wonderful uh, for the farmer. That's great. No, that's yeah. great. Those are some great. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, those are some great use cases. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Mark, uh, I, you, you talked about uh, some of your customers. Can you go a little bit further uh, in depth on, uh, you know, how I know you're specifically focused on the vineyards, uh, why this category, why this industry and, um, and how adaptive was, was this group of customers uh, in, in terms of switching over to what they had been using um, uh, to your new technology and, and any results, um, you know, cost savings or that they've, you know, that they've experienced since using, um, since using your technology. Sure. So, um, so of the vineyard customers we have, like say, I think it's up around 14 or 15 now, uh, most are wine grapes, some are um, table grapes, uh, but the results are the same. Think of us as um, doing three things. We're a doctor and a coach and a predictor. So we're a doctor in the sense that the plants have to achieve a certain status at a certain time of the year. And if they're not, there's certain things the grower can do to improve that performance. And because we're looking at a plan and geolocating it, um, we can go over back over that plan. And we know that that's fine. Seven row six is not performing the way you thought it would The um, Or perhaps, uh, you know, it needs some treatment. For example, the leaf density is too high and the sun's not getting on the grapes, et cetera. There's various things that growers look for but because we can image every plant, every single plant in the entire grow, we can have a knowledge that is, doesn't exist anywhere on the, on the farm. Um, and then we also look as a doctor because we're looking for things that are bad, uh, that shouldn't exist, mold, uh, disease, stress. Those will show up most visually, most of them visually, we can see those also. And then we can tell the grower, hey, you need to go look at that apple tree uh, you know, seven row five, um, there's water stress. So that, that's the kind of thing that we do from a doctor standpoint. And then as a predictor, ultimately, because we have complete knowledge of every single plant in the grow continuously, we can predict yield. We can predict harvest timing. Um, it's a level of granularity. Now there's some things re related to food safety that appear to be emerging. Uh, cause I know the subject here is really food safety among other things. And, um, because you're imaging every plant, you can have chain of custody. So you know that the, the, and what's happened as you probably know in any grow, if you took an acre of grapes or an acre of peaches, they don't all grow the same. <laughs> uh, trees have a life. They have a, a bushes, trees, plants perform at different rates and for different reasons uh, that not everyone understands, but if you understand the differences between the plants, I always joke that the ideal school would have a tutor for every student. Unfortunately, you have to teach to a class. Uh, same with a grow. I, if I can, if my lowest level of resolution is the acre, then I have to manage to the acre. Ideally, in the real world, in the dream world, I'd manage to the plant. And that, because we can image every plant and we do and geolocate it, you can now manage to the plant. And when you can manage to the plant, you bring differential, differential treatment or precision agriculture, whatever, however you want to describe it, to its ultimate conclusion, which is now I can manage literally every single plant. Um, and a lot of people are sort of, you know, was hoping to move in that direction. Results to date um, varied, actually, a lot of various results. Um, 
first of all, we've had uh, last year was our first time in the field. We got yield improvements on several of our customers that they would not have gotten ordinarily as a result of our data. I don't want to brag about it because other things affect that and they freely admit that, but they claimed to us that it, we had a substantial impact uh, on their yield. I'll take that any day. <laughs> but I, as far as you know, hard data, you know, I await the results of this year. Um, what I would tell you for every customer, and this goes not just for the grape customers, but for the other crops that we're now working with, is <clears throat> they never had this kind of transparency in the condition of their plants. They just simply didn't, it didn't exist. Um, this level of granularity, this level of detail at scale, it's never existed for them. And they've used drones and they have consultants who inspect the crops and they've used all kinds of tools, but to be sort of boots on the ground, looking directly at the plant for each plant, that's new and different. So, um, and then one last thing I'll, I'll give you, just to give you a sense of how this world is emerging uh, and how this technology, whether it's ours or people like us, uh, one of our Growers in France came up with the idea that in the EU, you can get, European Union now, you can get money for taking carbon out of the air. And the, the challenge is you have, to, uh, you have to convincingly show them exactly how much woody mass is alive in your farm. And so one of our uh, French customers, a very uh, famous French vineyard that chooses to remain unnamed, but a very, very famous one is one of our customers. We were doing early bud count which was about a month ago where we were looking for the early, uh, early incidents of buds and we were counting individual buds on individual plants for the whole grow. And they said, hey, can you calculate the woody mass? You're seeing the entire vine naked, if you will. Can you calculate the woody mass? And then that, that's, a, that's actually a relatively easy thing for us to do. Um, so we were able to calculate the woody mass for the whole grow and they took that to the EU and got a check for it. Um, and that paid for everything and then some. Wow. So it's as if we don't have to do any more work <laughs> you know, right away. You know, we didn't even plan on this product. So that's now an offering uh, in, in Europe that we have with our customers. So that's great. And, and just around, you know, sort of the climate change and, and all yeah. the initiatives that, you know, not, not only are, are, you know, international and global, but uh, in each specific region, I think that that's great to show evidence of being able to manage that and make improvements upon that year over year. So, yeah, you know, that's great. Um, Christian, I wanted to kind of uh, ask you about what, you know, in terms of investing in companies, uh, what are some of the key things that you look for uh, from CEOs, teams, technology, and what are some examples of companies in your portfolio? Sure. So I get, yeah, happy to start with criteria. I'd say general criteria, Colt Sivian, we invest seed through series B and opportunistically at the late stage. I'd say historically, though, our sweet spot has been series A, and that's where the majority of our investments have been. In terms of specific criteria, we do look at uh, obviously, quality of management team. We look at market size. Uh, we look at technology adoption, customer traction. But I think one way we do bucket it in terms of a framework that might be more relevant is we bucket companies typically in three different areas. So the first one is product market fit. Uh, and that's typically where a lot of our earlier stage uh, opportunities and deal flow, that's that bucket that they fall into. The second is business model risk. And then the third is execution risk. Uh, so that's always a framework that we have in mind, especially as we get to know companies at a very early stage. Um, and perhaps we don't invest in one of the first rounds that they're raising, uh, but we do continue to track their progress. We're always trying to bucket on this product market risk scale, have you de-risked and moved into business model risk or at least further along the curve in product market. And same thing for each of the categories. Uh, going on. So that's a framework that we do tend to, to keep in mind, both for new investments, but especially for companies that we do have a little bit of exposure to. In terms of specific examples from our portfolio, I guess two, two I can talk about. Uh, you know, the first, I guess, you know, Full Harvest, uh, a company that we had bucketed more in the business model risk stage at the time of investment, uh, their B2B platform for imperfect produce, uh, really taking a lot of the quote unquote ugly produce on the farm. Uh, and selling that to other companies that can make use of that. 
Uh, and then separately, they're also looking at uh, CPG co-branded uh, snacks and other products uh, using those ingredients that uh, they're sourcing on the farm. So that's, that's one that falls more broadly into the food waste bucket uh, and supply chain more broadly. Uh, and then the other is leaf agriculture, which is one of our seed stage investments. Uh, and leaf is an API platform for the broader ag tech industry, uh, taking a couple different groups of data sets uh, and integrating all of those. So the first is machinery data, uh, John Deere, c &H, all of your major tractor brands and other equipment on the farm, uh, being able to build integrations to those different sources so you can build products on top of it. Uh, they also do integrations for satellite imagery data, uh, both free and public sources and in addition, proprietary sources. Uh, and then also looking at operations data, John Deere Operations Center is one, but another of other ag tech startups who, who fall into that broader operations data category. And then they're working on products for soil related data and weather related data as well. Uh, so that goes back to the theme of trying to build the underlining data infrastructure for the ag tech industry. One thing we noticed is that most other major industries have a standard API platform and those API platforms have grown to become massively influential. Twilio, Stripe, Plaid, Segment, there's a number of others uh, in all different kinds of industries, but we haven't noticed that yet in agriculture. So that was one of our, our investment thesis areas with LEAF uh, and what they're doing. So those are two portfolio companies that uh, you know I can talk to on there. Yeah, and uh, in addition to investing funds, uh, what other support or you know, strategic um, resources can you offer companies that are in your portfolio? Definitely, yeah. So there, there's a couple different areas. I'd say the first and, and the first area that we do most actively, I would say, is on the business development front. So making introductions to potential customers, potential partners, uh, key strategics who might even be potential acquirers for these startups down the road. Uh, that's one aspect of our business. And we do that through the broader Cultivian network. We also have a set of strategic LPs who span across the food and ag ecosystem. Uh, so we're always able to facilitate those types of introductions. And then depending on the team member background and skill set, there's a number of other areas. So these span everywhere from hiring, again, using the Cultivian network to hire uh, sales, technical, we, we can do both. Uh, another area is even more simple things such as building out financial models or target investor lists for future fundraising rounds, other small tasks that could help a company accelerate a future fundraising process. Um, you know, preparing the data room, the small things like that, those are all things that we're happy to do uh, with potential startups. And then of course, at the board level, uh, we are active investors and historically we've taken board seats in most investments. So, so definitely offering a strategic perspective or feedback uh, there as well. But at, at the end of the day, we're always gonna defer to the entrepreneur. They know their business better than anybody. Uh, but that is an area where if they do want a sounding board, we're always happy to be that sounding board. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin, I know that we kind of focused on food and, and applications use cases sure. uh, for food specifically, but, uh, but your products um, can be used in other industries. And I know you have right. use cases, for example, uh, in water infrastructure. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about um, how your product fits that and those applications? Sure, sure. So I, I think water is very exciting. Obviously, food and water have a lot of the same problems with porous concrete. So, so the nature of concrete pipe or storage tanks is that they're porous and that concrete is chemically unstable. So our technology solves both those problems. Now, there is no other coating that bonds to concrete and there's no other coating uh, organic coatings like epoxies and polyurethanes that don't hydrate and basically fall off if they're in a tank. So basically plastics cannot be uh, used to coat concrete because they cannot survive uh, being underwater and the water pressure and the water chemistry. So, so they've all, people have just stopped using it. But our material is inorganic and once it forms its ceramic, it's the same as the ceramic in, a, in your cup at Costco or, or uh, I'm sorry, Starbucks, right? It, it's, just a, it's just inert, right? It's just glass and it doesn't care about time. It doesn't care about water or water pressure. 
but it also doesn't care about chlorine. And that's really important because all fresh water needs chlorine to keep the biologicals down. So not only do we get rid of biological habitat on the surface of the tank and the pipe, which stops you know, those biologicals from being emitted into the fresh water, but we're immune to the chlorine and that chlorine causes concrete to dissolve and it also rusts the rebar. So you're going into, if, if you see one of these tanks, Lori, this is not like a tank in your backyard, right? This is like walking into Costco, but it's buried underground and there's a major soccer field on top of it, right? Wow. This is a whole city block and it holds a million gallons or more. Water is very heavy, so you need concrete, but the chlorine is eating the walls, especially where the, the air and the water mix at the surface. And there's currently no way to fix the problem on earth. And so we're, we're happy to be the first. Um, we just made it through phase one in the UK. Uh, we were adopted by the uh, Yorkshire Water District after, uh, for their asset management plan, the seventh version of their asset management plan. Uh, Stantec, which is a global uh, A&E firm, architect and engineer firm that built water plants and sanitary sewer plants around the world, uh, did our study and found us to be superior to uh, epoxies being produced by a company called BASF. And so now they're, used, they're, they're moving in the direction of two things. For wastewater, stormwater, and sanitary sewer systems, they can use our technology now because they don't need freshwater certification. So we're bidding, currently bidding on a project, uh, a multi-million square foot project in Dubai. Uh, and we, so on the freshwater side, we just passed phase one of our DWI testing. Uh, that is their freshwater testing in the UK. And we'll, we'll finish the next phase of it uh, over the next six months. And then they can go into their freshwater system. So our, and basically repair the tanks and repair the delivery system through concrete pipes. So really for the first time, our technology stops the root cause of those asset failures. The micro cracks, the corrosion caused by chemistry, the corrosion caused by just basically water pressure and water flow. And our material can basically make those concrete holding tanks and pipes immortal because our material doesn't care about pressure at, at all. Uh, you, you can put a 3000 PSI right, right up against it. It doesn't care about the types of pressure you see in a water tank, which has to do with some engineering terms, which a little bit, little bit abstract. But our, our technology is really exciting for water because it could basically make water infrastructure immortal. And our material also doesn't care about ultraviolet light or salt or heat or extreme cold which means we can be outside on a dam or we can be underground in a water tank and, and our material is still basically immortal. Got it. Okay, no, thank you so much. Um, now, Mark, I know that, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how your product has evolved, has it evolved uh, from what it originally, um, uh, you know, and, and where you see, you know, future possible uh iterations being how you see sure. your product evolving any future uh, plans uh, you know to take your product to the next level sure um, it originally we originally started off in cannabis and we had a handheld device so the device that we use now is a camera about yay big and it attaches to a tractor ATV pretty much anything on a farm that moves you can drive normally and click turn it on and you're good to go just pass it in front of the crops. The original version was a handheld device <clears throat> that used something called a liquid lens, which was a lens of liquid that ad adapts to multiple focal planes. It's like, you remember your biology class when you're looking through a microscope, you had to make adjustments to see the object. If you're using AI to look at an image, um, and if you just use a traditional one focal plane, you're, you're, you can't use the AI in any useful way. So this takes eight focal planes at nearly simultaneously. And then it, you could see a microscopic vision of the plant. And then we would count the trichomes 
and the color and size them. And then that would tell the grower something about the THC and some other things. We stepped back from that because cannabis market at that time, a year and a half ago, was fairly chaotic. Um, and we found a bigger opportunity with doing it at scale outdoors and using the camera, as I like to say, a standoff version. So that's how it evolved. Where I see it going is I, I have a, you know, I have all of a year and a half in ag. So I don't know. There's a lot I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot I don't know. I, I can I can overwhelm. I can I'm in awe of what I don't know. Um, it, but my take is what's happening in ag right now is there. If you imagine a Venn diagram, is a at the center of these <clears throat> slightly overlapping circles is a battle over data, <clears throat> and it's taking many shapes and forms. But it's it's a battle over data. And it's being joined by what I can tell is three large parties. One would be the what's commonly viewed as big ag. So the big seed, uh, the, the, the Bayers, the Cortevas, et cetera, who are saying, look, you know, we sell to every farmer. And so therefore we have access to their data. They use our devices and tools and that data will be packaged and resold to everyone else. And we will do that because of our position in the market. We are uniquely qualified to keep it take up that data and transform it and resell it. There's another group that says not, not so fast. And these are the people that make what I like to call the stuff that moves on the farm. So these are the people that make the combines, tractors and everything else, whether autonomous or otherwise. And they're saying not so fast, we're gonna put sensors we already have on our vehicles and they're gonna soak up data from everything that's around them and can on a continuous basis. Cause we're actively on the farms all due respect, Corteva, John Deere might say, and we're going to sell you the data. We're going to capture the data. We're going to repackage it, and we're going to sell it to you and other parties, including the farmer. And then there's a third party that's emerging that's probably making both of them nervous, um, which is the big data houses. Somebody, you've, Some people have heard of the Google X project, uh, a mineral that recently came out. There's another project called Carbon. Uh, Microsoft is a big player in ag, incredibly, uh, a, a bunch of other companies at Samsung, Sony, who imagined? These folks are saying, well, you know, we're new to ag, but we know data. So we're going to take the data challenge over and um, you guys will sell you the data and then you can do with it what you will. At the center of that is, is a emerging, and, and as, these de- as these Venn diagram circles start to collide and overlap, somebody's going to say, who knows about these plants? Who, who can tell me specifically about the condition of an individual plant? That level of resolution, as I call it, will eventually move towards the plant level. And there are startups like ours at the center of that swirl, some trying to organize the data, some trying to package it, some trying to analyze it, some like satellites and drones trying to capture it and analyze it. So that battle is going to ensue, and I think to the benefit of us all. Um, But who knows what shape it's ultimately going to take. But I can tell you, that's my, you know, on the ground view (laughs) of this uh, climate, this uh, galactic uh, data battle that seems to be happening in ag. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a really interesting um, kind of uh, framework for that. And uh, Christian, you were talking about sort of the data collection being, you know, a, a key, uh, you know, key uh, trend. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts um, in terms of, uh, you know, where technology is going, um, just in terms of the data collection and, um, um, you know, what, where that might be in five years from now? Where do you see sort of the industry going? Yeah, I mean, I think ideally in five years, we're, we're at a point where if you want to develop an ag tech product uh, that leverages all the different data sources that, that Mark was talking about, you're able to do so quickly and efficiently. Um, so I think that's hopefully where we're at in five years. And I think right now you can do that in silos and depending on what kind of application you're building, it's possible. But in others, it's it's much more of an uphill battle. So I think I think that's that's ideally the goal in five years from now. And I think the other is, 
I think as other industries, I'm thinking about even biotech companies who could leverage, um, you know, industry data from, from agriculture right on directly on the farm. I think as you see interest from other ancillary industries that are related uh, to food and agriculture, as they continue to be more interested in, in capturing some of that data for their own analysis or products or services, I think that's a really big positive sign for where the industry has progressed and where they're at as well. So I think that's that's another signal I think that we'll hopefully see uh, in five years as well. Um, so that those are kind of two, I guess, frameworks of, of mine that I have there. Okay, great, great. And and in the essence of, of time in closing, um, what I'd like to ask now is um, since, since you work with and evaluate so many companies um, in ag, in ag, but in all um, related industries, what advice would you give to startup companies who are um, in in the space uh, or or in any of these spaces that we talked about trying to solve problems that are either problems today or or problems that they see um, being future uh, challenges? What uh, what pieces of advice or tips do you have uh, for founders? Sure, sure. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, um, don't want to offer advice on strategy as much, you know, given that's that's founder's forte. But I guess, in general, just always keeping in mind, aligning incentives with potential investors that you might bring on board, both with your vision, your goals for the company, uh, timing as well for certain milestones with the company, just making sure that's aligned with the potential investors that you'd like to bring on. I, I think is important because at the end of the day, there is a lot of capital out, out there. So I think it's important to evaluate beyond the capital, uh, what does a single investor or group or syndicate of investors, you know, what does that bring to the table for you as a founder? Um, and making sure that that's in your best interest, but also making sure that also aligns with how the investors are thinking as well. Just that matching process, I think is really important. So I think that's, that's, probably the biggest advice I could offer. And that, that takes time, it takes a lot of conversations, it takes a lot of research, but hopefully uh, you're able to find that right fit. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the main advice that I'd have. And you mentioned something uh, earlier on in terms of, of where you tend to invest. And that is, uh, even, even though seed is an area that you invest, your sweet spot is series A, um, do you find um, that you ha- start having conversations with companies perhaps uh, earlier, um, earlier than you might invest? Um, and, and again, uh, what does that relationship look like? And, and typically, um, you know, is, is there a process, so to speak, like a pipeline of uh, companies that, that may not be, you know, may not be at the right stage now, but could be? as they continue to gain traction and, and continue to grow? Sure, yeah, if, if possible, we do like to have conversations with companies uh, even beyond perhaps uh, or earlier than the stages that we typically invest. Uh, again, it's just trying to get as much data points and touch points, especially again, in a virtual environment. Uh, I think that's important uh, for, for us as investors. So I think that that is something that we, we do do if possible. Sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes we do just see deals, you know, at the current stage and, you know, have to act quickly. But it's something we, if, if possible we'd like to do. Um, I, I think also with regards to uh, pipeline and, and what we sort of see in alignment there, I, I think the other thing we're thinking about is when we go out to raise future funds, some conversations we do have is, is this company a better fit for our current fund that's at this point close to halfway, halfway at allocated, or is it a better fit for fund four? Um, and the fund four strategy might shift a little bit from fund three, whether it's stage, whether it's areas within food and ag, whether it's even branching off a little bit from food and ag, those are all thoughts that we're having uh, right now. So that's another dynamic as well uh, that, that we think about. Not every fund is like that, but sometimes there is that that weird middle ground where you're transitioning between funds and that could alter whether now is the right time or later. Got it. No, that those are all good points. Well, um, thank you so much for your time. We are out of time now. So I think, uh, thank uh, you as well as the uh, startup companies um, 
for all of their input uh, in this panel. And um, um, thank you.